Well, you can take your Bibles and turn in Scripture to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. We're not going to read uh, chapter 7, beginning uh, verse 1 to chapter 8, and verse 32. But uh, we'll be reading it as we come to it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide us now. Pray that the Spirit of God would teach us what that we may glorify you. What we may tell others. Give our mouths voice to tell them about Christ. Give our hearts compassion for the lost to tell about. Father, I ask that the Spirit of God would make His presence known in our lives today. And dear Father, I thank You for what You want to do. Thank You for the children that have shown up for the Children's Church encourage the hearts of Nicole and Robert. Father, we pray for the opportunity of beginning a team ministry so please, bless now this time together around your holy word. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Rather than reading chapter 7, verse 1 through chapter 8, and verse 32, I, I want to, you to see a biblical principle that Solomon states, and it's, uh, it is very applicable to the scripture that we are looking at today. It's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 1. Proverbs 29, verse 1. Solomon makes this statement, he says, he that being oft reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Please, Lord, again, bless you. This morning, we're going to begin examining the consequences of a hard heart. In the next three chapters, chapter 7, 8, and 9, we are given to the telling of an individual's hardening of his heart, particularly Pharaoh's heart, and how God works out the deliverance of his people because of a man's hard heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart and he resisted the authority of God in his life. Pharaoh blinded himself and refused to recognize God. And in doing so, he incurred the wrath and judgment of God. Some are quick I think as you read this, to point out the truth that God pardoned Pharaoh's heart. And that is true before it is pointed out that Pharaoh hardened his heart. 
if you decide to reject God and you do it long enough, God will inevitably grant you your wish. Only after Pharaoh had proceeded to harden his own heart, knowingly, willfully, and sinfully, did God oblige him. Now this morning, I want you to see with me the first two responses of a hard heart. Part one and part two next week. The first thing I want you to notice this morning is the first response of a hard heart is that of blatant disobedience. And as you realize that, I make it a statement uh, again, because Pharaoh's initial response was blatant this obedience. Moses and Aaron had stood before Pharaoh and delivered the message of God. In fact, if you go back to chapter 5, verse 1, and you look at verse 1 and 2, you'll see, and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Pharaoh's response was this. Who is Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel, go. That's his response. And let's put it in a modern vernacular, if we may, or give it a, a simple translation from King James. Uh, and hear what Pharaoh was actually saying in our language today. It's this. Who does Jehovah think he is to tell Pharaoh what to do? See what he's saying. You will notice that Pharaoh proceeded to increase the burden of the children of Israel. From now on, they would have to make the same number of bricks, but they would have to gather their own straw in order to make the bricks. And it would. You will also notice that Moses, when he left the presence of Pharaoh, after hearing what he said and uh, mandating a new work order, that Moses left his presence, uh, uh, left Pharaoh's presence dejected and depressed. They given him God's message. He rejected. I want you to even notice, and I think I pointed this out last week, that the people also blamed Moses and Aaron for the work increase that 
had been given to them. So Moses took his burden, according to chapter 5, verse 22, to the Lord. And there God reassured him of his unchanging purpose. In Exodus chapter 1, we saw then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of Notice in particular, God tells Moses after Moses had come to him, Moses, you go back to Pharaoh and tell him he must let my people go. Exodus chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. There's the command. Now, where God explains to Moses what he can expect to happen. Look at chapter 5, verses 1, uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I made the Yonah to Pharaoh and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children out of the land, or out of, I believe it says, his land, that's Pharaoh's land. And I will harden, here it is, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Look at what happens, verse 4. But Pharaoh not hearken unto you. That I may lay my hand on each and bring forth mine armies and my people of the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. Egyptians shall know I am the Lord. And when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them, he will know. Moses is talking. that Pharaoh does indeed ignore the signs done at the hand of Moses and Aaron. Look down to verse 10 of chapter 7 and you will hear It, 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 it says very simple that Moses, I said, didn't do nothing. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say, I'm, no wonder it doesn't sound right. I'm getting the right chapter. I've been doing that all morning, I think. 
verse 10 of chapter 7. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. <clears throat> now, the magicians, look at it. <coughs> the magicians of Egypt, they also did it in like manner with their enchantments. And again, as you look here, you will notice that they duplicated what Moses and Aaron had done, the signs and wonders that God had given them. So that shows us the third thing that Mo <clears throat> same thing. His servants could duplicate them. Uh, we have to realize that when the magicians were summoned and they did indeed seem to be able to turn their rods into serpents just like uh, uh, how uh, just how these magicians uh, uh, were able to do this is uh, among many Bible teachers a mere conjecture whether or not they were able to perform some kind of optical illusion or using the slide of hand or actually you are making a gen uh, doing a genuine miracle through satanic power uh, that, uh, that is continually argued among biblical scholars but the one thing we do know that whatever they did satisfied the heart of this wicked king. Go down to verse 14 of chapter 7. There in verse 14 it says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. So Pharaoh had resisted all of the efforts of Moses to get the children of Israel released to go into the promised land. The issue now must be forced. And it would take ten plagues before Pharaoh would give the command to let Israel go. So now the plagues begin. And as the plagues progress, Pharaoh's heart becomes increasingly hardened. Even when Pharaoh seems to relent, he inevitably, inevitably, 
fails to keep his promises. But please note that the first plague or, or the first uh, uh, of God's judgment was against the waters of Egypt. What did he do? That is the plague of the Nile. It, the water was turned into blood. Uh, in verses uh, 14 through 24, we have that recorded here in chapter 7. But I would have you to note in verse 23, though, of chapter 7, uh, we are told that Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. His heart is hard. This plague lasted seven days. It was a very severe judgment by God. And if you go back, I'm tracing backwards in, in, in verse 11 uh, of chapter 7, uh, you will notice what uh, it says there that. Uh, uh, in verse 11. My hands are feeble. Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did like manner with their enchantments. Now speaking of what they did, verse 15. And Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, go out into the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink, and against thee come, and the rod which was turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand, and thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness, and behold, hitherto thou with us not here, and thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will smite the, with the rod that is in my hand on the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Pharaoh's heart is hard. Again. Now, you'll notice the first point. It is a blatant, a blatant to hear what God says. Stop and wonder what that word blatant The harshest. I don't have to obey God. Look at my magicians. Look at my wife, and they can do the same thing. But I have to tell you, they could not cleanse the water. Again, it takes seven days. And that only is because Pharaoh came and asked for the plague to be passed. And Moses delivers by the hand of God's grace. We have many today that will say to God, God, you can do anything you want, but I ain't going to do it. I just ain't going to do it. 
I know what I want to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And regardless of what you say, or what the preacher says, or what anyone else says, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And we go on and disobey what God has clearly shown them from the Word of God. And from the mouth of God's name. It is in refusal and a response to the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. I pray that men hear and see what God has said from His Word. And to notice the so second response. Hard heart is bold in sincerity. The second plague that God brought was the plague of frogs. Look at verses 1 through 15 in chapter 8. And the plague the frogs was upon ancient. Aaron stretched out his hand over the water of Egypt, and the frogs came out of the waters, and they covered the land. Look at verse 6. And the frogs came up and covered the land. you to note that they didn't get their skillets out and try to have fried frog legs. I don't know if you've ever eaten them. They can be very tasty, but they did not. These frogs came out of the waters and, and, and multiplied somehow under the power of God throughout the land. But please take note of this. Because this is especially significant because the frog was considered sacred in Egypt. And the frog could not be killed. I don't like to learn to a problem. Oh, I can't kill it. Out of the sink comes a problem. Uh, my sister had this experience up in Oregon. Uh, they had this, uh, I, I've told you before, she lives off the grid right now. She's moving to Oklahoma. But uh, uh, she said that. Uh, I don't know what happens when you go into the bathroom sometimes and it's warm on the outside. Look out for the frogs. I said, what do you mean? She said, they come up through the toilet. I said, well, if a frog comes up out of the toilet, I'm going to come up out of your roof. These frogs were coming out of M. Everything. And there was nothing the Egyptians could do about the situation. They came, uh, as we will note, to loathe the very symbols of their worship. In verse 7, it says, And the magicians did with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Now, stop and think about it for a moment. Look at this situation. Moses and Aaron, upon the command of God, had the frogs go. The enchanters come and use their uh, enchantments and frogs more frogs come. I 
I think you see the fact that the magicians could produce even more frogs. But this could hardly be of any comfort to anyone. from me and from my people and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. That's what Moses says. Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs. Which I ask God to take them out of your houses that they may remain in the river only. Possibility 
do they turn to God? And this is the situation we see with Pharaoh. that in times of relief, when the frogs are taken care of, what happens? Short-term memory, they forget God. situations to endure another plague because of one man. Now, the exact identity of these insects are not, it, it is not known. From the Septuagint, that is the Greek version of the Old Testament, we get the word gnat. Now, the Hebrew word here 
may indicate a form of a sand fly or flea that can dig deep under the skin and cause great itching and irritation and a lot of pain. Now, if you've ever been to the South, uh, if you've ever been to the South, you immediately think of chiggers. They're, they are those little bugs that attack you from the grass on your legs, your hands, your body, and they dig in and they uh, cause you to be miserable. If you've ever experienced something like that, I think you can realize, I think you can understand what the Egyptians were going through. They were plenty of in the Egypt. The Turks had got a hold of them. Now, the importance of this third plague is that for the first time, the magicians of Egypt were unable to produce the lies. That's even after they tried. They couldn't. And, uh, and this was convincing enough to, I think, provide a, a most uh, astonishing uh, uh, confession. What I say as in verse 19. Uh, then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is a finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hardened. standing there at attention. I think they are scratching like crazy. This has to be the finger, oh, the finger of the Lord, of God. Unless we forget he knows his heart. We see a fourth Uh, and this is found in chapter 8 and verses 20 through 30. And that fourth plague is, I would have you to know, the plague of flies. I don't know about you, I hate flies. About as much as I hate snakes. I just don't like flies. I don't like them landing on my hamburger or my uh, dessert, and, and I go to swat them, and the next thing my hamburger or my uh, dessert goes splattering everywhere, and my wife is like, no, this. Now, I want to tell you, I'll share it with you. Uh, we've had a couple of flies in our house, but I'm in the bed. I told my wife, I said, Hon, I'm going to get rid of these things. She said, you can't spray, you'll kill the birds. I said, no, I'm not going to spray, I'm going to make a weapon of mass destruction. I rolled up the newspaper, I had a rubber band about it. And I splattered a couple of them things all over. 
about this plague of flies, it is important to note uh, from the fourth plague on, the children of Israel are not affected. The land of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, uh, can I use my imagination here, had an invisible shield of protection. What it was, was the hand of God. You're not going to touch my people, you dirty, stinking flies. But the plague brought great swarms of flies. And by the way, if you look at the Hebrew here, it also indicates that this plague brought not only great swarms of flies, but other insects over the land. In fact, uh, uh, if you look at that word swarms in Hebrew, uh, uh, it says that swarms are uh, not, uh, not if, if you don't bother to uh, uh, specify what insects were involved with these, this word. All kinds of flies with other insects. It was in all the probability that these insects of Egypt increased unnaturally They infested the streets. <clears throat> they infested the homes. They infested the food. But I would even have you to notice you with your chapter 8. They infected the court of Pharaoh. something with me, folks. When we face plagues in our lives, may not be insects, may not be flies, may not be lice. Plagues of life that you may be going through, they are indeed they are indeed tough to endure. Amen? They can be painful to the core. But God has no desire to leave us in pain stress because of the circumstance we are going through. Listen to that Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk, a prophet once prayed to God. Chapter 3, verse 2. Simple. He says, in wrath Remember mercy. Hallelujah. In wrath, remember mercy. Let me submit this to you. The Lord has done just that. Jesus who endured God's wrath through the uttermost on the cross, now invites you and me, us, 
to walk arm in arm with Him through the rest of our lives. He is our faithful. He is our ever-present friend. And no earthly catastrophe, no earthly plague of situation can ever separate us from the omnipotent grip of His grace or the legacy of His love. Paul, writing to the Romans, says in chapter 8 and verse 35, what shall Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, persecution, famine, Nakedness, apparel, or sword. Jump down if you would, if you're following that in Romans chapter 8 <coughs> and verse 38. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can go through the plague. Don't harden your heart against the tender God. Oh yes, me delivers Israel as a judgment against sin and unrighteousness. But he loves us and has given us Christ. And as believers, he has given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to guide us, to teach us, and to glorify him and to use his word in our lives. We do not need to shout to God in unbelief. Let me go. We are now free by grace in Christ. Eternally. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, please use these words to glorify yourself, instructing your people to realize what a hardened heart can do and how you used these plagues to let our people go. Please, dear God, speak to our heart that we be not disobedient, but be obedient to your leading, your work in our lives. I ask in the name which is above everything.